of an important aspect of the curriculum that are mentioned there and we are expected to know up to four, level four of it, okay? So without further ado, this is the scenario that we will start with. I hope that everyone can see that. So uh, Abdullah, this is a 60 year old gentleman with, uh, as you can see, a open wound with an infected open reduction compensation of the right proximal tibia. He needs removal of metal work and debridement. Um, you've done the procedure and you find that there's an, a significant bone defect uh, in there. How do, you, how do you feel that defect? Look, I have to assess the defect appropriately through the x-ray and since there is an infection, so I cannot use the patient's own bone graft uh, because it'll, it'll just fail. So I have to fill it with something that has calcium and allow me to deliver some antibiotics. The options I can think of is either Stimulan or Ceramint G because they allow me to um, uh, deliver antibiotics and they fill the gap and they can turn into bone. Okay, so you've managed to fill the gap in with uh, your bone substitute with antibiotics, but uh, you also uh, discover that um, you can't close the skin. You've managed to get good soft tissue coverage, but you can't get the skin to close. Uh, what, do you, what do you do in this scenario? I mean, you can cover it with some skin graft. However, my skin grafting techniques are not the best. Um, alternatively, I can use a holding measure in the form of a vac pump and refer the patient to the plastic team as soon as possible. Excellent. Um, so, and if you do uh, manage to get a skin graft on, and this, sorry, the plastic surgeons did, did manage to get a skin graft on uh, a couple of days later, but at nine months, uh, he's represented with no, uh, no progression to wound yet. yet. Um, and he doesn't want any further procedures. What options do you have now? I have to exclude the presence of infection as a cause of this non-union. Now, if, if this was excluded, then uh, discussing with the patient the causes for him not to have to want surgery. I assume that he had plenty of surgery. And if he's fed up with that, we can try something like uh, pulsed uh, ultrasound waves like exogen see whether that could encourage the bone to heal. Um, and I will have that with the discussion with the patient. Okay. And naturally, of course, uh, before you even uh, considered doing the surgery, you would have normally talked about uh, having plastics uh, available to you, uh, but you were put in a scenario where you didn't have. Well done. Um, Thank you very much. Very little detail in what he uh, gave to me, but today he's going to give you, uh, give you all a huge amount of detail. Thank you, Abdullah, please go ahead. Thank you, Shwan. So, um, the first part of the talk, as you've noted, is about the uh, bone uh, substitute and bone graft. Now, this is to, uh, a complement to the uh, lecture given by Ajith, our colleague, about bone back in July. However, I decided to complement that by talking about different aspects of it. At the most recent evidence about specifically bone grafts and bone substitutes. So what do we mean by bone grafts and substitutes? It's any material that you can use uh, to help the bone heal through its properties. It is supposed to uh, give a mechanical support to the bone at the same time as biological stimulation to allow the healing. And that works in different methods. Um, however, in, in practice, the common indications for it is to provide structural stability. For example, you've taken a big tumor leaving a big gap, and if you leave it like that, the bone can collapse. So you want something to fill that gap and hope that it will turn into a, new, a bone in the future. The other thing is you have done a fusion and the bone quality in that area is poor, or there is a big gap that if you compress the bone, the patient will be shorter. So you want to fill that gap with something that will again turn into bone later. In trauma, either because you've got an acute bone loss or chronic non-union and you want to fill that gap with something. So these are the scenarios that can come in the exam where you will mention the word bone graft. What is the ideal bone substitute? And I'm talking here about substitutes in general, anything that can fill the gap. It should be osteoinductive, osteoconductive and osteogenic. And I will be talking about these in a minute. You have to, these have to have no immunological rejection risk, or at least, you know, the least uh, possible risk. It has to have very low risk of transmitting infection or ideally no risk of infection. It should achieve incorporation by gradual substitution, which means that slowly the bone will 
take over and fill the whole gap completely and the material should uh, resorb. You should be able to mold it into the defect regardless, regardless of the defect shape. It should be, uh, allow for sterilization and tolerate temperatures. It should be available readily at a reasonable cost and it should be biomechanically similar to the surrounding tissues. Now, if you think if, of these, there is no ideal bone substitute available. The best that can come close to that would be the patient's own bone borrowed from somewhere else. So how can we classify these? And this is the definitions that I was talking about, the osteoconductive, which means it has a three-dimensional shape allowing the bone to grow into. Osteoinductive means that it has the proteins that allow the bone to grow. Osteogenic means that it contains cells that allow the bone to grow. A material can be one or all of these three. According to the source where we can get these from, we have autograft, allograft, xenograft, and bone substitute, artificial materials. So autograft is the gold standard because this is the closest you can get to achieving all the previously mentioned points because it is sterile, there are no immunity issues, there is no infection, infective issues, it incorporates rapidly, and it has proteins, it has the three-dimensional shape, and it has the uh, cells. So in an ideal world, this is what you should be using. The downside is you have to harvest it from somewhere else, which means you are leaving that area vulnerable to complications. In addition, it is limited supply. You can take as many without causing major problems to the other source. Hence, you can use it for small gaps only, but when the gap is big enough, unfortunately, you have to rely on something else. Talking about allografts, which is grafts taken from other humans and then processed in a way to reduce the risk of infection and immunological uh, uh, response, they can be fresh, fresh frozen, freeze dried, or DBM. So the fresh is when you take it immediately from the other person and then just uh, clean it and try and reduce the infection. Fresh frozen uh, reserves the BMP. The freeze dried does not reserve the BMP, which is the protein mostly uh, linked to encouraging the bone to heal. And then we will talk about the D DBM separately. Xenografts are not available in practice very much, which is from other species. And then we can talk about bone substitutes, which, is, which are artificial materials that represent some aspects of the bone and allow the bone to grow into that area. That can be having the calcium component or other compounds or polymers or a mixture of the above. In general, these are the benefits and risks of each in comparison to each other. Uh, this slide will be in the YouTube, so I will not dwell on it. You can uh, look at it uh, later on from the YouTube channel. But I've talked about the important one, which is the autograft. Now, what are the risks of uh, bone grafts? In general, you have donor risk morbidity, you have disease transmission, which we've alluded to, which cannot be 0%, but we are talking about very, very few numbers nowadays. We are talking about one in 100,000 or one in 10,000. And then immune sensitization. You can put the bone graft as an inlay graft, which is just using it to fill the, gav the cavity, or strut graft, which gives structural support. So you are using cortical in the second and cancellous usually in the first. How does it incorporate? You notice that I am talking very quickly about these aspects because as I mentioned, these are covered nicely by Ajith. Um, so again, if you, if you look at the picture here, you start with a bone graft at number one, then slowly there will be some inflammation which will attract the uh, blood vessels and the uh, immune cells. And slowly that would lay a new calcium uh, through peeping substitution. And on the x-ray, it looks like uh, increased density. And then slowly that will remodel and the original material of the bone graft, which is the cancellous bone, has completely disappeared. 
In the cortical bone, the story is slightly different. The first two stages are the same. However, the, you don't have a creeping substitution and most of the action happens at the surface and the core of the material of the bone graft remains for years and sometimes never disappears. Okay, so the autografts in use, the most common used one is the iliac crest and it is the commonest. It has a complication rate between two to 36%. Uh, the anterior has more risks. Um, the risks are bleeding, injury to nerve, surrounding nerves. It can lead to hernia if someone is very aggressive at damaging the uh, insertion of the muscles. Uh, infection, fracture, scar, and cosmesis, and uh, chronic pain. And that is to do with the position of it and uh, as it is very close to where the belt is. The fibula and the ribs are the most common source of vascularized autografts and can be used as a strut grafts. Now, what I wanted to talk about is this new technique. This is called ream irrigator respirator. It is borrowed from when we used to uh, ream the inside of the bone. Um, someone thought of, okay, what if I put a filter at the end of that and all the debris from that reaming which is bone marrow plus bone plus blood plus all these juicy things, if I filter it and put it back into the, into the cavity. And actually, it, there is a, um, an increase in the healing because it is concentrated, it is the patient's own material, and there is no, immu no uh, immunological reaction to it. And you can mix it with other aspects like bone substitutes to increase its bulk. The downside of that is it is an additional procedure. So imagine yourself trying to fill a gap, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a, a gap in the spine and then having to drill and ream the tibia or the femur to get that. It's, a, it's an additional uh, procedure with its own risks. So probably what, what is a halfway between is when you are reaming, for uh, the nail of tibia, just try and keep the reams and reintroduce them again into the, the area of the, um, of the gap. Or you can use that for severe cases where there is significant non-union or malunion nearby. Okay, allografts, uh, they come as morcellized, which is broken down into small pieces, cancellous, corticocancellous, cortical, osteochondral, Whole, ball seg whole bone segments, um, like the femoral head, which you can get and you cut the way you want it, or DBM, which is demineralized bone matrix. What is DBM? There is a standard process for making the DBM, and it is made up or uh, brought up by uh, URIST. Um, so these are the stages. First of all, you break it down into small, the, into the bone into small si uh, particles, then you demineralize them in HCL for three hours. Then you clear the HCL with sterile water and alcohol. That um, leaves all the proteins and maintain the shape of the bone. Okay, so it acts as osteoinductive because it contains all the proteins that are needed. However, the bone material, the, the calcium, is almost gone, so it does not have uh, the strength to hold the mechanical stresses. On its own, it, it is not enough to, to increase the bone healing. However, if you combine it with other substitutes, especially calcium uh, products, then it increases its effic efficacy. The common question is uh, bone banks and how to set up a bone bank. And again, it is being answered by Ajith Tok. I will just quickly run through that. The, the first step is to donor selecting. And that process uh, means that you have to consent them for it. You have to ask to explain the situation to them and you have to get a, uh, a pool of patients who are willing to, to donate that, their, their bones after death. Or, you know, after procedures, um, after death usually, sorry then you have to screen the patients clinically and with blood testing and then you sample you harvest the sample and then you prepare the graft and that is by physical debridement mechanical cleansing then alcohol soaking to reduce the bacterial load and then antibiotic soaking again to reduce the bacterial load 
gamma radiation to reduce the immunosensitivity or sensitization, sorry. And the last bit, bit is to demineralize it uh, like DBM. Then you have to consider the storage and um, the lifespan of it. And it depends on the temperature you're leaving it between the lower the temperature, the more expensive it is, but the longer it lasts. And then methods of distributing it. Um, so when you store it, it can be fresh, fresh frozen or freeze dried, as we mentioned earlier. And what you can request as, as an NHS doctor, you can request a fresh frozen femoral head, which the, the benefit of that is it comes in an entirety and you cut it to the shape you want. And it's commonly used for cutting wedges for either acetabular surgery or for uh, high tibial osteotomies. Our, it can come as cancellous cubes, which you can put in a bigger uh, voids or cancellous struts. Now let's talk about bone substitutes. Again, these can be divided depending on what you are replacing. So if you are replacing cells, then you can use injecting of mesenchymal stem cells, which has been tried. Um, however, it is expensive. And I think currently I don't, I'm not aware of any hospital where this is a common practice. You can replace stimulating proteins like BMP7 and BMP2, or you can inject platelet rich plasma PRP and some places do inject that. It is a easy procedure to do. Basically, you take the patient's own blood and then you uh, put it in a sedimentation a machine that will just spin very at high speeds and that would separate the plasma from the red cells and you can inject the plasma back again into the patient themselves. Again, I'm not aware of any trust where this is a common practice. I work with the limb reconstruction team. We have the facility to do that, but I haven't seen it done frequently. Um, the last thing, which is the more common one to be asked about, is replacing minerals with the, uh, the ability to add antibiotics. These can be calcium phosphate, tricalcium phosphate, calcium carbonate, hydroxyapatite, sulfate, silicon-based polymers, or a mixture of the above. Quickly, let's talk about them. So calcium sulfate is the most commonly used one. It comes as pellets or powder. The common one is stimulan. It allows you to add antibiotics to that. It is fastest at resorption at between six to eight weeks. And it has a high risk compared to all the others of having a serious drainage. It is sterile. It is just the byproduct of breaking down of the calcium sulfate by the body's tissue. The calcium carbonate is not commonly in use and it converts in the body to calcium phosphate. The calcium phosphate can, can be in two shapes, either tricalcium phosphate or the cement. The, the tricalcium phosphate converts into hydroxyapatite. It resorbs in about three, uh, sorry, uh, 13 to 20 weeks. It has faster absorption than hydroxyapatite and it has a similar strength once it is solidifies in uh, similar strength to the cancellous bone itself. It comes as injection and then you leave it inside, you, you leave it outside the body. It's like the cement you usually use. And then when you inject it into the body, it goes solid. The second shape is calcium phosphate cement, which is a combination of more than one calcium product. And the idea is to benefit from the different rates of absorption. So you have something that absorbs very quickly and then something that takes long. The issue with that is the ideal substitute will have to absorb as the bone is growing. So there will be no area, no, no time where there is a void. The problem with the first products, the first three products is they tend to get absorbed before the bone has fully integrated into that gap and filling it. So there will be some void. However, the cement, uh, the design behind it is some of it will get absorbed, leaving a space for the bone to grow while the, while the rest of it is still there, holding the gap and, and filling it and preventing uh, uh, structural weakness. The new technique that I wanted to mention is this CPC in 3D printing. And this is a clever technique um, where in certain areas you, you can apply it. Again, I think in the UK you can do that and it's, it's available, but I think it's available only in some centers. 
and you have to apply for a permission to for the funding for it. Basically, you do a CT scan into the area, you decide how much is the gap, what is the shape of it, and then you send it to a company that prints a three-dimensional st structure um, to fill exactly that gap. And that the, the, the material they are using is a combination of hydroxyapatite and beta tri uh, calcium phosphate. And that combination is, is the cement, as we mentioned earlier. As I said, it has the benefit is, is number one, filling exactly the same shape, the same gap. Number two, this three-dimensional structure allows the body to allows the bone to grow there faster and in, in a, a bigger rate. And at the same time, it lasts as long as it is needed to, for the bone to do that. Let's talk about hydroxyapatite, which you can get alone, but again, it's not common, you know, you, you don't see it. The reason is it takes very, very, very long time to be resorbed by the body. Um, and it is very brittle, so it's not used for its mechanical st uh, structures. The biphasic product is the one we talked about, and the one commonly used in practice is the ceramic G uh, that I am aware of, and G stands for gentamicin, so it allows you to add some antibiotics to it. And new materials like bioactive glass are silica-based, and they contain, cal contain calcium oxide and phosphate. And when you put it in the body, they form a layer around them, which is like a jelly. And that area protects the, area, the, 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 the material and allows the bone to grow into it. And then slowly some of that gets resorbed. Um, it is expensive and in practice, not many surgeons like it because they have this glassy feel when, 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 you've, when you, you know, they, they, they leave these glassy uh, granules in the wound that, that patients may not li like. A polygallic, uh, sorry, polyglycolic acid and polylactic acid, again, have osteoconductive properties. Uh, you can put them in three-dimensional shape, again, to encourage that. But I, I, I'm, I haven't come across them, and I believe they would be expensive. Um, the evidence you can quote is uh, calcium phosphate allow for bone defect filling, early rehabilitation, and prevention of articular substance, subsidence. Let's talk about substituting proteins. Uh, let's talk about BMP, uh, bone morph morphogenic protein, is a natural ma uh, material that exists in the body which and increases at the time of fractures induced by uh, osteoblasts. Um, the, S the FDA in America and the UK have approved the BMP2 for open tibial fracture as selective clinical indication, and BMP7 for uh, with uh, iliac non-union and traumatic bone defects. Um, you, they are not used alone. Some people believe that the amount we are putting in the wound, sorry, in the fracture, is so small that regardless of how much you put, it is so small compared to the body's physiology that you need something else. It works, but it's not a, it doesn't work alone. So you have to have something else as well. Um, this is coming from uh, bovine usually. They are coming from, this is the, the, the material uh, available in the market in the UK, and it comes from bovine origin. So what is the available evidence? I'll leave this for you to read. So basically the, the bottom line is allografts represent first choice for most reconstructive solutions. However, in revision total hip replacement, you don't have the femoral head. So they are uh, saying that in general, fresh frozen bone is firmly recommended for structural graft, freeze dried and irradiated bone may be used alternatively for impacting grafting. So this is from effort in Europe. There is another evidence about the role of bone grafts for foot and ankle surgery, same thing. And in spinal surgery, that's from the UK. And again, they are saying that they, they have good evidence of working in the combination of BMP and bone grafts. The last evidence is this review, <clears throat> which looked at the use of recombinant BMP2 in lumbar fusion, and they found that it does increase the rate of union. This is from 2020. Before we continue, um, does anyone have a question about the above? Or shall I continue 
Um, Sorry, uh, do you mind if I do ask uh, Abdullah because uh, yes. one, because the next topic is quite different. Um, yes. So Atif Mahmoud has asked, um, how does DBM act as uh, osteoconductive, and also how does DBM powder provide structural support? I, I didn't say that it does provide structural support. I said it provides the proteins, as you can see here, I mainly mean, as osteoinductive material. Here you go. So there is a there is a difference between strut and structural. Um, mm -hmm. I would be very wary about uh, mixing up those two. When we say usually when we say structural, we do mean uh, it's a microstructural, not actual taking weight and things like that, which is mm -hmm. different to a strut giving strut support. But yes, you're right. Uh, uh, you didn't say uh, DBM is structural support. I said it may be possibly act as osteoconductive materials compared to general allograft because yes, it still maintains the three-dimensional shape and the, the three-dimensional shape of the bone, and the, the bone likes that, and it, it actually stimulates the the uh, angiogenesis and stimulates the osteoblasts. There is new evidence that one of the stimulation of osteoblasts to differentiate is actually the three-dimensional shape of, of the structure around them. And that's why, if you look, the new, the new materials, they are all 3D printed to allow this to happen, to stimulate the osteoblasts through this 3D shape. Yep. So that's how it can be osteoconductive. It's the three-dimensional shape. But the main thing is, Osteoinductive. Now, as you mentioned, Deshwan, it is different than the structural, as in allowing to, to, to take compression. So the DBM, you should not rely on it to fill a gap where the bone, the patient will be walking upon and expect them to hold. What you usually do is the typical you know, use for that is, for example, if you have a, a, a tibial plateau fracture. So you put a raft of screws on top, you have a big gap, how do you fill it? You can use DBM to fill that gap because it incorporates bone faster than any other material. And you can combine it with Ceramin G, for example, if you're doubtful about infection. And that combination gives calcium, gives hydroxyapatite, gives the proteins and gives the three dimensional shape. But you are not resisting pressure. Compression, I meant. You're depending on your raft screws for that, absolutely. Yes. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, um, I think that's quite clearly explained. Uh, I hope you guys uh, ha are happy with that. Thank you, Abdullah, please. Uh, please no problem. Do. Shall we continue or do you have any questions? As, if anyone's got any questions about bone grafting and uh, substitute bone graft, please do uh, speak up now. Okay. No, no Fine. So, uh, Let's talk about the vac pump, which the, the technical term is negative pressure uh, wound therapy. How does it work? No one knows how does it work exactly. However, there are theories about um, and, and observations about why it may work. Um, and it is to do with two phenomena, which is macro strain and micro strain. So macro strain is what you can see with your own eyes which is it draws the wound edges together, it just distributes the negative pressure across the wound itself, and it may remove some of the exudates from the wound, it does remove the exudates, and that can result in reducing the infection. However, this has not been proven, the infection bit. The micro strain, however, is probably where most people feel that it, it works, which is the encouraging the most wound healing by promoting granulation tissue and angio new, new angiogenesis. It um, increases the cellular pre proliferation and migration into the wound, and that, and that by itself can speed up the healing, and it can reduce the edema, and again, this is not 100% um, proven. <clears throat> the studies sh suggest that it increases the number of fibroblast migration by three folds and they reduce the cell death by two to uh, two point four fold. So there is some cellular uh, result of the vacuum pump. 
When do we use them? We can use them either in acute or chronic conditions. In acute conditions can be used in traumatic wound with deep extensive skin defects as the one you know, uh, uh, described before. Um, surgical excision, when you finish the surgery and you find that there is big defect, uh, when there is a skin dehiscence um, and you want to fill the gap with something without stitching and putting the rest of the skin under pressure, and when using skin grafts. In chronic wounds like ulcers, um, it speeds up the, the uh, development of granulation tissue and shortens the healing time. When cannot we use it? If you think of it, you are applying negative pressure around the tissues. So if you have uh, tissues that are vulnerable, then you shouldn't apply it. Malignancy, again, because you are spreading the infect the, the tumor. Um, when you have a non-explored fistula, then you should not allow uh, uh, apply it. And when you have eschar, because the eschar will prevent the negative pressure from working, so you are just wasting time. You use it, you, you have to consider uh, using it, sorry, you have to think hard before using it when you have weakened blood supply or vessels, because it may explode and cause bleeding, when it, it, delicate structures are exposed, when there is active bleeding currently, so try and stop the bleeding before that. If you have fistula that, uh, you know where they're coming from. Patients requiring certain treatments like hyperbaric oxygen or they are going to an MRI. This, this is you, they are not saying you should not, they are saying you should consider. And additional precautions when you have spinal cord injury or infected wounds. The important message is, it is not a replacement for proper debridement. I've seen surgeons do a bad job at debriding the wound and then say, well, the rest of it will be done by the vac, which is not true. You do a proper debridement and then you encourage the granulation through the vac pump. It is not treatment for infection. It is not treatment for crap surgery. How do you apply it? You use a sterile reticulated polyurethane sponge there are different color of, uh, of that. You use a silicone interface to stop it from adhering to the wound. So when you take it off, you're not taking all the granulation tissue and it doesn't cause pain. You have three types of foam that you can apply. Black is the standard one, stimulate granulation tissue for large wounds. White, it has a smaller cells that protect fragile tissues. And the gray, which has silver, which you can use if there is infected infection. Then you apply an uh, adhesive plastic sheet uh, to seal the whole thing, including the pump uh, tube. And you can set it at any pressure you want, but the common pressure is 125, sorry, minus 125 millimeter mercury. You put it at a setting of either continuous or intermittent. The continuous you use initially. And the reason for that, is you want to um, allow the seal to complete itself. And then after that, once the whole sealing has happened days later, you can change into intermittent suc uh, suction, which is five on to off minutes. That allows more granulation tissue to fall. If you are putting a skin graft, you have to put it at continuous. The dressing itself is changed 48 to 72 hours at least. Uh, I mean, maximum, so you can change it more frequently. And the, uh, like infected wounds, and the canister itself has to be changed at least once weekly. What are the complications? It, cause, it causes pain, bleeding, and some patients don't like the noise that they produce. And the cost is the main thing. Um, if you compare it to the complications of wounds in, in difficult operations or difficult settings, then these complications are nothing to, to, you know, to, um, to be compared with. Um, the foam can cause irritation and can break down the skin. As we mentioned, it should not be put directly into the skin. You have to have a separation layer between the two. If you see the vac, sorry, the um, tissue viability nurses, when they apply it, they, they, they spend even, you know, they spend double the time that we do to apply that. And we apply that frequently, but they, they have their own technique where they add a bit of cream around the edges to protect the skin edges and have some jelly petroleum, petroleum jelly again around the wound edges to protect them. Yeah, but as a surgeon, these are what you need to know about. What is the evidence for that? 
The Cochrane did some review in 2018, and what they are saying is there is no clear difference in healing rates in participants with open fracture wounds treated with vacuum pump compared to those receiving standard care, which is interesting. And there is uh, moderate evidence that it is not cost effective. In addition, for treating pressure ulcers, again, they say we were not able to draw any conclusion, and that was in 2015. Interestingly, though, if you look at the NICE guidelines, which is what you should quote in the exam, they say that for diabetic foot problems like ulcers, you are, it, the uh, negative pressure treatment provides, there is good evidence that it works, provided that you discuss it with the MDT, foot care, foot care service, and SIGN agrees with that as well, SIGN in Scotland. There is a new portable vac pump designed to, for the patient to be able to take home and look after himself. It's called the PICO. It works exactly the same principle. And for whatever reason, NICE feels that it is a good thing to apply even for normal wounds. So this is something you can quote in the exam. So the PICO, which is the portable, shape, portable the, uh, version of the same, is supported by NICE. And if you look at the uh, NICE guidelines for complex fracture, they say consider negative pressure wound therapy after debridement. If immediate definitive soft tissue cover has not been performed. Okay, that I will end the vac pump. Any questions about that? Um, no questions from the, our audience. I have a question about PICO. Um, PICO is quite expensive. Um, are we sure that there is a similar cost? I think it's not as expensive as you think, to be honest. If you compare it with the vac pump, it is much, much cheaper. Patients mm -hmm. like it. I misphrased it. Uh, PICO for a standard incision. Uh, Absolutely. It is very expensive. Yeah, but I, I, I have to admit, uh, I, I have a confession that I did not manage to get through the whole recommendation for this. If you look, I've, uh, I've crammed a lot of guidelines into this. So this particular guidelines, I did not manage to go through the fine details of it to see how much they estimated the cost of it exactly. Uh, however, it's available there and you've got the number there and we can look at it later. Yeah. Having said that, in our trust, as I said, I work in a limb reconstruction this is something we, we reuse very, very frequently. And in fact, patients who have diabetes, patients where um, we feel that, for example, the, 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 the soft tissue is going to be compromised, we use that liberally. And so you don't know, use it as your primary. Sorry, I just. No, no. I, that no, was the impression no. I had when you were spe uh, speaking. Sorry, my apology. Um, all right, so you if you look here, point. what they phrased it is, evidence supports the case of adopting PICO negative pressure wound dressing for closed surgical incision in the NHS, which is interesting, as I agree with you. It, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense compared to, if you compare the price of it compared to the normal dressing. Okay. But I think, you know, people, people take that with, um, with their own, uh, you know, they, they use their minds, they use their brains. Okay. Uh, one of our other mentors, Imran, do you have uh, something to say? Yeah, it's just to add on the on the PICO dressing, actually. I mean, I work in a unit um, where we, we manage complex wounds uh, from revision surgery, from sarcoma surgeries, uh, bone tumors. And actually, we use a lot of PICO, but uh, it's not um, as a primary kind of device. Sometimes for, for partially, um, partially open wounds or for revision wounds that are still oozing, so in the first uh, 20, 40, 48 hours, you know, um, we found that it's, it's, it's actually very good to use a PICO and then we can we can step down once the wound becomes dry. So I think it's, uh, it's a very useful thing and it's, it's very portable, like Abdullah mentioned. It's easy for the patient to manage. They can go um, back home with it, um, with community um, intervention from, um, from the nurses. So I think it's a good one. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure about the how, how expensive it is compared to the uh, proper... I think, I think for, the, uh, for our audience uh, and anyone preparing for the FRCS, at the moment, I wouldn't recommend uh, saying PICO as your primary wound for a standard yes. uh, <coughs> yes. operation. Okay, I agree. Uh, we move on. Thank you. Sorry, guys. I just wanted to establish that we, under, uh, 
that yes. that is what we meant. Okay. Excellent. The last uh, bit is the bone healing stimulant stimulation. What I mean by that is methods to encourage, to nudge the bone into healing. Um, you can use systemic enhancement, distant skeletal injury, and electromagnetic fields. Let's talk about each one of them. So systemic enhancement is when you give the patient something parenterally or orally that is supposed to go into the bone fracture area and encourage it or nudge it to healing. People have tried using IGF, PTH, vitamin D, prostaglandins. None of them has proven um, you know, working enough to justify using it in, in uh, routinely. So we, we don't do that. However, I've, I've heard it many times, people say, give vitamin C, you know, give vitamin D, just in case the patient is uh, deficient. Uh, I wouldn't mention it in the exam as a recommendation for the patient, but I'm aware that it, there is something called systemic enhancement. The next one, which is interesting, is distant skeletal injury. Studies, and this is well known for some time, but it doesn't come into practice, into daily practice in every unit. In units dealing with limb reconstruction or um, uh, children, uh, they, 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 uh, they use this principle. If you injure the bone somewhere along the line, it causes angiogenesis around it, in the bone itself, along the bone, and in the surrounding tissues. And in fact, if you think of Kynebock disease, one of the treatment of Kynebock disease is distal radial, you know, uh, not osteotomy, but you know, ju just cutting the bone there. And they didn't know how it worked. And then it proved that what, it ha what happens at a cellular level is just injuring the bone itself or doing corticotomy produces a lot of proteins that encourage new vessels to form at the same time as osteoblasts to pr progress and, and um, mature. And that encourages the healing of the distant area of that bone. And this is a well-known phenomena. So I, I've seen some surgeons who would uh, do corticotomy near a non-union to encourage it to heal. And in, you know, this is, bit, don't mention this in the exam, but some believe that even the pins in Elizarov has some effect in that, and that one of the benefits of Elizarov or the frames is actually it does this. Don't mention this in the exam, this is just a theory. Let's talk about electromagnetic fields. <clears throat> this stems from the fact that they have noted that there are two phenomena. There is electrical charges around the bone and the tissues in the bone, in addition, the hydroxyapatite crystal itself has what we call a piezoelectric current, which means if you compress it on a certain shape, on a certain direction, it produces a little bit of electricity. And if you apply electricity to it, it changes its shape. This is used in the ultrasound, as, as you know, for basic science. And some people believe that applying a massage around the, uh, the, the healing uh, can sell, uh, uh, callus actually uses the piezoelectric character of that to encourage the bone to heal. And again, that's another theory why the uh, Elizarov fine wires work because they allow a little bit of this compressive movement uh, across the fracture, which encourages the bone to heal. And they have noted that, if you, as you can see in this diagram, I hope it, it is showing from, from the pictures, that there will be a negative charge and a positive charge based on the, sh the, the, comp the compressive forces on the bone itself. So it's negative on the tensile and on the compression it's positive. So people have tried to use this phenomena to encourage the bone to heal by either applying mechanical forces or electrical forces or ultrasound forces. Let's talk about the ultrasound one. So we have the low intensity pulse ultrasound, which is called LIPOS. This is trying to use the characters of ultrasound by, stim by stimulating a certain area of the wound, of the fracture, to try and use the piezoelectric character of the uh, hydroxyapatite and the collagen to encourage the healing. There is conflicting evidence about it. Some say that it does work, some say it does not. And people who believe that it does work, believe that it increases the fluid flow, it uh, 
increases the circulation, redistributes the nutrients, and increases the oxygen and signal signaling molecules. Others don't believe that. They say that this, this does not transfer into actual healing uh, tissue. So let's look at the evidence. So the, the, the NICE guidelines looked at this in 2018 and found that uh, it has no major safety concerns. However, current evidence does not show efficacy. And that is for fresh fractures. That's 2018. Then they looked at for fracture at high risk of non-union and the same thing. The current evidence is very limited to quantify and, and quality, in quantity and quality. So they don't recommend it. And what about non-union? They again repeat the same thing. The current evidence is inadequate. But when it comes to exogen, which is ultrasound, low, low um, uh, voltage, low, low uh, wave ultrasound, the NICE says, supported by clinical evidence, high rates of fracture healing, and it does saves a person 2,407 per patient compared with current management through avoiding of surgery, and that's for the established non-union. However, the evidence for delayed union is not as robust. So to be honest, I don't know how they come up with that conclusion. Um, however, in the exam, you, you mention the NICE guidelines. And if you are going to say the um, ultrasound, don't say the ultrasound, just say exogen, because that is by name in the, in the NICE guidelines. And for me, it is like this, where everyone looks at the data, each one sees something different. Anyway, that's it for today. Um, I hope that was useful. Um, you, I know that it is a lot of information. Please, you know, refer back to this uh, lecture later in YouTube. And if you have any questions now, you can ask and later you can put it on the Telegram. Thank you. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Abdullah. That was a very detailed and informative talk about three very important uh, subjects that do come up quite regularly in the exam in different forms. Uh, so just in answer, I had a look as well whilst you're talking about the PICO dressing. So there is another separate paper which I have from NICE, which I've put onto the chat for people to have a look at. And just to confirm, it is, yes, it is recommended in primary surgical wounds that are closed, but in patients at higher risk of infections and at an equally long risk what can constitute high risk of infections or developing a seroma. So predominantly oncological surgery, particularly breast reconstruction. There's quite a few randomized controlled trials available that sort of show a reduction in, in infections. So subsequently, whilst it's a little bit more pricey at 140 pounds to 120 pounds, actually it's cheaper than having to take a patient back to theater to reclose a breast wound. Okay, uh, one question I think uh, from all of us is what's the difference between um, lipus and exogen? Other than obviously, exogen is a brand name. I, I spent all yesterday trying to answer this question myself and I couldn't answer it. So, looked at the literature from the exogen itself, um, looked at the website, looked at the NICE guidelines. I could not find the difference. I'm sure there is, otherwise, you know, nice in its glory wouldn't separate the two, but I failed to find it. And I'm sorry, I, if, if someone can find the difference, please enlighten me. And I'm not saying that jokingly, I am serious. Um, I honestly don't know, but my, there are different types of low, low, low grade, power, low, low intensity pulsed ultrasound. Um, one is um, continuous. You put it on the patient under the cast or on with a dressing um, and they walk away with the machine attached to them. And the other one is uh, done by physiotherapists where they spend half an hour to an hour uh, um, giving a directed uh, pulse, pulses. Um, exogen, 
I think is the one done by physiotherapists, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Failure of any program. There are many definitions of non-union. One of them is to say, if there is no, no sign of progress of healing at all. So you to take an x-ray six months down the line and it's exactly the same as it was six months ago, then it is unlikely that with the coming three months that it will unite. It, it doesn't happen like that. So, yeah. Um, it's one of those things in terms of once you start observing uh, something, it can change the outcome as with any experiment. So you have to be very careful when you go down this route. Yes. Um, so um, as for, for the guys that are out there, you can see that we're not convinced one way or the other with the data. Absolutely. The information that we have um, in the exam, don't come down hard, pro or anti these therapies, because you don't know what the examiner on the other side, you just make sure that you're, you say you're aware of these therapies and these are things that you would consider after discussion at your MDT. Okay. okay. Couple of things. So the way I would, the reason for this uh, um, presentation is number one, so that you can know how do these topics come in the real exam question, how the, the discussion can lead to you mentioning these. Number two, so that you are aware of the conflicting evidence about some of these. So I would anticipate that if you are discussing these details, you are talking about the level eight, so the score eight. You finished everything and the examiner just wants to chat to you about the latest evidence about PICO or about the VAC pump or anything like that. And if you reach that, it means you've passed and they just want to see how much evidence you know about these topics and how do you think about them and you know how do you think outside the box, okay? Um, just going back to this question, which I have seen, I find it confusing to understand that the powder will give structural support. The powder will not give structural support. You mix it with a, with a fluid and that becomes solid, like the cement. The cement can give structural support, doesn't it? But the way it does is you mix it and then it can give some structural support. It's not the, the liquid that provides the structural support. So um, it comes as powder, you mix it with a fluid, you keep it to become solid and then you inject it or you, you put it in the, in the bone. So it does give a little bit of structure, but as, as we discussed earlier, it's not enough for the patient to walk on. It is just enough to hold that small area of bone from collapsing on its own weight, if you know what I mean. You are relying on the, on the raft of screws to hold the whole bone, okay? You are, you know, you are stopping the blood from going there, the clots from going there, the bacteria from getting there by having that, that, that solid thing. Does that make any sense? Or am I talking gibberish? No, no, I, I understand. I, I think it's something we have, to under, we have to appreciate that we talk about macroscopic and microscopic. So Absolutely. microscopic structure, we think of the scaffolding. But yes. that's all your big chunks of coral, of coral uh, mm. in the bad old days. But this is of the microscopic, what the the anatomical sort of, sort of the micro, molecular structural support that you mean from, the, from that point of phrase. But um, the key thing though is I want you to make sure you understand what osteoinductive, osteogenic, and oft, and osteo um, inducive are. So as long as you understand those key things, you're safe. This is what we want to make sure that you understand. Absolutely. Okay. Imran, you wanted to say something. Yeah, thank you, Abdullah. Um, very exhaustive uh, lecture. I know. <laughs> Still on the topic of uh, ultrasound, exogen slash lipos. Um, so I've, I've seen a few, I don't know what evidence uh, you've seen so far on the indication of ultrasound therapy, especially for uh, things like plantar fasciitis. Oh uh, no, that's, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. Okay. That's a different talk. I was going to talk about it. Mm. Uh, but number one, the time caught with me. Number two, in fact, that was my fourth topic. But I strictly kept this to the bone healing. Okay. So we're talking about only ultrasound for bone healing. Okay. Thank you. That was my fourth one, but I'm, I'm afraid time didn't allow me to, to, to deliver that. So we can present it another day. Yeah, well, I'm waiting for someone else to volunteer that as well. I think I've bored people to death with, with my oh, talks. No, no, this is people. Uh, um, this is a difficult topic. It's a topic which you've done really well, Abdullah, um, and it's an important topic because if it, if you're if you're reaching the discussion about uh, bone. Mahmoud, 
uh, you, you can also then proceed to talk about the ancillary uh, side of wound management and uh, non-union uh, mm -hmm. non-operative options. It just demonstrates you are aware and you've worked in the center that does these things, okay? Yes. It is, it is quite an important topic, which often is missing from uh, a lot of candidates. Fine. Okay. If no one has a question, we can uh, proceed to the next part. We can stop the recording, I think. Okay. Uh, just before we go, again, thank you very much, Adora, for a fantastic talk. Uh, again, you. I'd just like to reiterate, as I said at the beginning, um, there are still a few places left on the Viva course coming this Saturday. And also, as aptly advertised in the, on um, Schwann's um, uh, bookcase, uh, the Concise Orthopedic Notes textbook is available from um, your online retailers.